What up, party people? It is your boy, Chef Nigel Henderson, and my partner in crime, Omar Alcibar. What's up, everybody? And we are the Gumbo Pot Podcast. That's it. Oh, my God. Such <laughs> high production value. You know, we try. You know, <laughs> I'm in a bar in Europe right now, as you can see with my backdrop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, living your best life. <laughs> it's, you know, it's like 30 degrees outside, so I have this warm crawfish hoodie uh, that you can find at <laughs> the Feast LA. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's a shameless plug, by the way. I am in my living room. <laughs> no stylish bar. However, someone did give my fiance this. Like uh, one of her friends sent her this flower arrangement, but it's like the biggest thing I've ever seen. So like Pretty I'm big. walking by, it looks like somebody died. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand you. I'm like, oh my god! But look okay. at the ambiance it's creating. It looks amazing. Look, it's like a headdress. It's a headdress. It's Omar, you got a headdress oh today. It's oh, it does. Oh my god, it does look like that. <laughs> that is our special guest today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, she's in the wings. She's in the wings. You can't see her yet because I have to do a, a you know, a, a great um, intro. Oh, oh, and Lord. so, uh, our next <laughs> guest, uh, Omar, I've actually known this young lady for quite some time. Um, and you know, she's she's one of those multifaceted people that uh, she has so many talents. And she Aww. hides them. Um, she doesn't want what? any of her friends to know. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but I'm, 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 I'm slightly right. adding extra mayo on it. Um, <laughs> our guest today is a, an actress. Um, she has the voice of an angel. You may have seen her in movies such as Django Unchained. The D is silent. Ooh, get him. Uh, <laughs> she's been in episodes of Treme. She's also been in um, American Horror Story. Uh, mm -hmm. But she's like the homie, and she's, she's pretty amazing. Um, I want to introduce not only the Gumbo Pot Podcast followers and all that, but also you, Omar, to my really good, <laughs> close friend. Dana Gorier. Oh. oh! How you doing? How you doing, Dana? <laughs> thank Hi. You. First of all, thank you guys for having me on your podcast. I love it. I watch it all the time. So <laughs> I was like, thank you. Uh, thank you. when's it my turn, Nigel? Like, really? So <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. I love y'all. I have much love for y'all on the show. I fully support you. Thank you. Let's go. And we appreciate you. Um, thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so, Dana, before we start um, mm -hmm. in true Gumbo Pot fashion, Gumbo Pot podcast fashion, excuse me, um, we <laughs> give a toast. Um, we also talk about what we're drinking here. Um, I'm going to let you start off with what you have in your cup. Ooh. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> oh, it's a big one, y'all. Look at that. Oh, that's that's New Orleans yes. style. With my name. Yes. You got your name on no, it. No, this is water. This is just water. <laughs> um, I'm so lame for that. I yeah. I could have just lied and said it's a it's a bottle of champagne. It could, you know, a bottle could fit in it. A bottle. Let's could go with that. Me. This is yeah. a bottle of champagne. <laughs> no judgment. No judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Omar, what you sipping on today, brother? I uh, am drinking some bullet bourbon. Nice. And, nice. Uh, you know, some ginger ale, just so that it'll be, you know, it'll keep me hopefully just sipping it all the way through. Because the last couple shows, I've gone through like three. So I was like, okay, let me, <laughs> let me make, you know, add more soda and then maybe I won't just I crush them. Like <laughs> I was yeah. worried. What are you drinking, Michael? Was pretty heavy. So I, uh, I'm doing a boiler maker today. Um, oh, there's man. a brewery in Los Angeles called All Seasons Brewing. Um, and th I did a tasting with Black Bourbon Society. It's a, a Black Bourbon uh, whiskey aficionado Society. crew club. Um, and they did a tasting 
with the beer and Sloan Irish whiskey. Excuse me, Slain Irish whiskey. I miss, miss Nice. I would like to try that. That sounds amazing. I'm not really a beer drinker, um, so, but mm -hmm. the beer is pretty good. And it also keeps me from finishing this too fast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like Omar said, we will have these interviews by the end of it. It's like, so how your mama and them doing? What they up to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I'm rude. I'm rude. Before we start, let's cheers, ladies and gentlemen. Let's, 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 let's cheers. You got to get eyeballs. Yeah. Eyeball. Yeah. Clink, 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 clink. Boom, and we starting it off. Mm. So good. Ah, how's that water doing? Delicious. Good. Hydrating. <laughs> it just, I can tell you drink a whole lot of water. Look I do that. actually <laughs> drink a lot of water. I love water. And, and you know, it's so funny because like some people, if you are a real water connoisseur, you know that water tastes different. You know. True. I mean, anyway. I, I yeah, I love water. I, love water. Tastes the gods. I also love whiskey. <laughs> Ooh. So, I don't know whiskey. It's just it's Wait just not it's just not whiskey today. That's all. I got I got two questions. I got two okay. questions. One, what kind of whiskey do you like? Like mm -hmm. what's your favorite whiskey, your go to? Honestly, makers. Mm. No, yeah, I'm not mad at makers. Okay. Some no, people no, try to hate on makers, and I'm like, don't try to hate on the red wax. Don't do that. Yeah. Like, mm. <laughs> I used to be, uh, I, I still have some. I still have some in my oh, liquor, yeah. like, cabinet. Um, but I used to be so into it that I, I joined their little online ambassadors oh, thing. Yeah. And they were like, oh, we'll put your name on a barrel. And then when that barrel ages and we bottle it, we'll let you know. That's and so then you funny. can buy a bottle of your bourbon or whatever. That's so cool. So I'm like, hell yeah, sign me yeah. up. Uh, but you and know, I don't know. Bullet is delicious as well. Bullet yeah. is the way yeah, you're drinking. Is, oh, I love it. Mm -hmm. I actually just, I gen generally go to whiskey if I'm out and about and, you know, it's not a school night. You know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I love whiskey. So and like any yeah. brunching kind of a girl, I love champagne. I love you know I, you know, <laughs> Nigel knows I'm from New Orleans, so we really kind of there's not really an alcoholic beverage that I don't respect or love. Like no, really? I don't really deal with beer too much. I'm not a beer drinker because you know our culture okay. is you know you crawfish or crabs and you have a, a ice cold beer with you. I'm not really mm -hmm. into beer though, but I, you know, I love wine, champagne, all the things. Let's go get drinks. Have you ever had? Have you ever had like a cider? Like, I, actually, uh, I love a from I actually love oh, cider. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. From Bras are so good. Mm. They're delicious, especially like a raspberry one. Come on now, guys. Oh. I'm at yeah, like the, my beer the dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got the they got that like the foil on top, right? Yeah, they got the yeah. like the different yeah, heck yeah. Yeah, um, I you, love, it. I love a good with a chocolate, Oh man, if you pour that with a chocolate stout, you can layer them and then it'll be like a chocolate raspberry or a, mm. yeah. I've had a black and tan and it was uh, I want to do that. That Guinness sounds delicious. Yeah. Cider and it was stacked like mm -hmm. that. It's pretty good. That yeah, there's good. a there's a chocolate stout from Samuel Smith, and it's called like it says like organic ch organic chocolate stout, and it's it's one of the best. And then that with that lambic, or I mean that framboise, so good, so good. All right, well then, uh, when these pandemic days are settled down, let's go get one of those. We'll we'll make a pact right now. Yeah, I'm in it. Let's we'll, do it. We'll get together. I'll make them. <laughs> oh. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Pinky swears. I love it. So, so when we, uh, with all of our guests, we want to, you know, unlike most interviews, this is actually a conversation with the homies. Um, <laughs> you know, so we're, we're going to ask some off the wall questions. You can tell us to shut the hell up. Uh, but <laughs> before we even get into that part, we want to know your origin story, how you got your superpowers. Like if you were oh. an X-Men or something like that. <laughs> Oh, when I read the email and it said that, I thought it was so funny and I laughed so hard. I was like, that's so nice. I love it. Um, what is my origin story, though? I guess, it, you know, born and raised from New Orleans. Uh, grew up in the East. I'm an East beast. 
Hello. You know, went to a school uptown, all girls Catholic school, went to private school my whole life, like primarily Catholic school. So that was kind of like the thing in New Orleans to do. Um, uh, went to undergrad at UNO, flunked out. I was really unhappy there. I was studying psychology. And then um, I dug out an old acceptance letter to UL Lafayette and sat my parents down and I was like, I want to study acting. I want to study theater, please. And it wasn't even really a please. It was like, I'm going to do this because if I don't, I don't, I don't like the direction my life is headed. So I, uh, I, like I mentioned, I had like a 0.75 GPA. And I, I don't say that, you know, uh, <laughs> hey, hey. excitedly. But I do say it because the next semester I had a 3.75 Mm-hmm. And I was on the dean's list for the rest of my undergraduate work. So look at this puppy. Hi. Look at this That's bourbon. Puppy. This oh is good. This is bourbon. Of course. Of course. Yeah, that's, that's say hi, Burb. Say hi, Burb. Look how hey, sweet the puppy is. Hi, pup. Aww. So for those that are listening to the podcast, we have uh, Omar's <laughs> dog, Bourbon, making a cameo. <laughs> <laughs> and it was precious. So yeah, I um I went to UL Lafayette and then um studied acting and then I I I wanted to see if I was worth my salt. So yeah, I did five years in New York, which I refer to as my PhD in a, a school of hard knocks life. Uh, like I mentioned, waited tables, gigs, did background vocals for recording artists, like did the whole nine yards of like. You know, background singing and, you know, waiting in line to audition and all of it. And I was in my 20s and it was just, everything was so alive. I was just so alive. And then um, Katrina hit, as you know, um, and one of the only things that I pulled from our our home, my childhood home, was my undergraduate degree from UL Lafayette. And that was my indication to, it was my inspiration to go back to grad school or not back to grad school, to apply for grad school. Um, and so I got into some really great places. One of them was a school called Cal Arts, which is out here on the mm-hmm. West Coast. Um, West Side. And then I uh, finished up with my master's in 2010 and then moved to New Orleans, moved back home after being away for almost a decade uh, because I had heard about a show called Treme. And it was about uh, the aftermath of Katrina. And my thought was, my singular thought was, they're not going to make a show about my city. I'm not on it. I'm going to be right. on it. So right. <laughs> that was a two episode recurring ar- arc. I I didn't know what I was doing. It was the first time I was really in front of a camera for real, for real. Um, but I just leaned on all of my training and whatever else. And that would begin... Um, that would begin the sort of road, uh, of my professional career as a film and television actress. So, um, and I think of myself as a blue collar actor. Like, I don't think of myself as like, like, cause I'd be hustling y'all. Like I mm-hmm. hustle. It's voiceovers. It's constant auditions. It's, uh, um, constantly reading and material and scripts and, uh, and then you're trying to figure out figure out the dance of your own work and the balance of like you working on your own artistry like it's you know it's it's not this simple thing of you learn lines and then you say them a lot of people think it's real easy and it's like Mm -hmm. and it's also you know i attribute my ability to deal with personalities on set to my waiting tables days in new york i i I dealt with a lot of people (laughs) a lot of different personalities right we had the boiler room bro- boys, which were these like stockbroker types that would come in on the phone, throw a ton of money. Hey, give me this and that and this, and then I'll take a thank you, sweetheart, and this and that. And you know, you just hustle and quickly get them their food, and they tipped you like sixty percent. It was ridiculous, you know. Um, and then you had you know a holes, and you had really snooty women, and you just had a lot of different personality types to navigate. And my objective was like, y'all all gonna love me. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, you exactly. this table, you're gonna love me. Yes, yeah. and you're gonna tip me well. <laughs> so I, I, I use that. I use that sort of philosophy and experience when I'm on set with all these different 
personalities and department heads and you know, mm-hmm. producers and folks that are seemingly very intimidating. And also I, I have the luxury to say that I have worked with some incredible people, like some really good salt of the earth, wonderful, good, kind hearted people, you know? Right. So well, you notice how she, anyway. she's really modest, right? Um, what? <laughs> You know, and I all right, doing, Nigel. All right. I just want you to know, just in case you didn't know, uh, you're popping. <laughs> when you do a search, although you're a friend, I know you. I know your family. I know your people. That's baby. Family, you my still, baby. You still have to do your homework, right? And ladies and gentlemen, you know you're popping when on, when you look up a person and on the, one of the, the first things that pops up is a person's net worth. That's not what pops up when you see Nigel Anderson. I mean, I didn't look at it, but I'm just saying, you know you pop in when. Look, Say you pop look, in when you know you pop You can't. I was like, damn, you know okay. You I think that's part of your algorithm, on the Nigel. Interweb, number one. Of course, uh, of course. Number two, I, I, I wish that network that they have out there for me is real, because <laughs> where, where is that? He's like, can I have it? Can you deposit it? I would it love to my- have that. <laughs> and that's the thing, right? Because like social media and the the and Google and the internet and you know the general information that people put out about you when they don't even know you, uh, because they're like fans or their fan base websites and everything. You know, it's mm-hmm. like so fantastical. It's the idea of like, oh, her net worth is five million dollars, and I'm like, right. five million where? Where they at? Like, what? The- <laughs> she is. You know, and it's like. Yeah, like yeah. I said, I'm a blue collar <laughs> actor. Like I'm blessed, and I I have a lot to be grateful for. But the hustle is continuous; it never yeah. stops. And I've noticed that even the folks that I know that have, you know, crossed over that realm of celebrity and um, a list actors. I know, you know, I know these people. I know mm-hmm. I have lots of colleagues. I've worked with a lot of people, and I don't say that braggadociously. I say that mm-hmm. to say, even for them, the hustle is continuous. It's mm-hmm. consistent. It has to be consistent. It never stops. Right. Your network could be a hundred mil. You still got to hustle for the lights to be on for a hundred million dollars. You know what yeah. I mean? Mm-hmm. A mansion's uh, electricity yeah. bill is still a mansion's electricity bill. You know. So yeah, anyway, it's, it's just, just a bigger the bill. Staff. <laughs> <laughs> and the private chef. You know? <laughs> I'm just looking for when you want to hire a private chef. That's all I'm saying. Right. Like, you probably like, that's, hey, what's up, baby? Right. But yeah. see, you know what's so funny? I don't have a problem, Nigel, like growing up uh, where I'm from, who I come from, like my people and those general aspects. Like, you know, the, there's the concept. Once you go first class, you can't go back coach. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. and it, it is tough to go back to coach once you've gone first class or business. Yes. But I'm not that, I'm not that <laughs> way. Like I can if we need to hustle and grind and I need to make some sacrifices this month so that I can do X, Y, and Z, like bet. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I don't know mm-hmm. why, but I don't know why I was talking about that, but I, I, I guess I don't want people to think net worth $5 million. I've got it. Made. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, I was just saying it. Cause <laughs> no. you know, I, I, when I saw it, I was like, damn, I didn't look at the amount. I was just like, I know somebody that's on the internet that has an sorry. article literally written about them, <laughs> about how much money they have. I'm like, damn, no. I've made it. I got famous friends. You, Nigel, <laughs> you are famous. What do you mean? Like, I'm so yeah, proud Nigel, of you. I need to shine the light on you and shout you out because like all of the endeavors that you have been embarking on and all of the things that you've done, I'm super proud of you. Yes. Take these compliments. You deserve them. You work so hard. May I please have some brioche bun bread? Thank you. <laughs> Thank yes, you. She's buttering me up so she can get some brioche. <laughs> I want some freaking bread, bro. Come on. I got you. I got you. I got you. I got you. I that bread and I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I was playing with the butter? recipe. It was a recipe for uh, stuffed bananas, foster stuffed french toast oh come on dude yeah, get away so from doing me. the Just bread hang up the phone <laughs> bye give Monday. it to me okay so. so so um when you went when you went back to new orleans because of treme mm-hmm. so you had to go and audition right so how was that process for you harrowing like scary 
um, a woman by the name of Megan Lewis uh, brought me in. She's a casting director based in New Orleans. And a lot of my credits I attribute to her. Like I, I owe her a debt of gratitude. Um, she brought me in for the initials, just me and her in the room. And then she coached mm-hmm. me. She directed me. And then she brought me in for the callback. Now this, I was not expecting the callback was um, like 15 people in the room. So, and we're talking David Simon, Eric Overmeyer, Anthony Hemingway. And these are some heavy names in the, you know, television and film world. Uh, right. David, David Simon created The Wire. Um, wow. Eric Overmeyer, what is he? He has something out right now that I'm blanking on. I'm so sorry. Um, mm. Anthony Hemingway is just everywhere, you know. So... I was just really, and then here's the kicker. I didn't even know who they were at the time. I was so new and so green. Right. My thought was, don't forget the line. Don't forget the line. Remember the line. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of Did you know it was though, connected right? to the wire? Yeah, I knew that uh, David, I at least knew that David Simon, no, probably not, if I'm keeping it real. <laughs> probably not. Like, I, I probably did not make that connection because I didn't really know about the wire at that point. I hadn't been right. a fan. Not I, I am a fan of it. It's one of the best television shows to me ever. Yeah, but, but, but you were grinding. I, I didn't, hadn't seen it. It's I hadn't seen yeah. it. So um but I realized later who was in the room. Um which has happened to me before early on in my career not knowing who I was in front of and who was seeing me and just just be honest and real and authentic. And right. it's almost a blessing though, right? That way. Yes. Cuz if you think mm-hmm. about it like if you yes. knew Yes. everyone's accolades and everything at the time of your first real big shot that's just added yeah, pressure yeah. so that you're like uh, 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 let me uh. let me tell you something <laughs> when i yes to answer your question yes uh when i auditioned for django same process was in the room with her she coached me uh we made some adjustments then i had a call back I was not prepared for how nervous I would be for the callback because it was just three people, but one of those Mm -hmm. people was Quentin Tarantino. And Mm -hmm. so when I was downstairs, uh, it's just going to sound weird, but it was totally normal. We, he, they rented a suite for the callbacks. They didn't have it like at a building and it was totally legit. legit. We were in a den or a living space and there were two casting directors in him. But when I was downstairs at the Roosevelt and waiting to be called up, I remember had my hands were just like my whole arms, <laughs> like my, from my shoulder to my fingertips, I was just shaking. And then um, I couldn't catch my breath. I couldn't like calm down. And then I heard this very simple voice that said, Dana, he's not God. Calm down. <laughs> it's okay. No, that's perfect. He's not God. Now, I do think of him as a God in the film world. Mm -hmm. Quentin is a genius. I love him to pieces. He's great. But I had to check in with myself. Like, he is also a man. He is a human being. And let him see you. Because I feel like we fail to let people see us because we're afraid of what they're going to think or how we're going to mess up or whatever. And the moment mm-hmm. I had that thought, my hand stopped shaking and the casting assistant came up to me and was like, Dana, are you ready? And I was like, I looked at my hands. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. So and then we went up and then the rest is history, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I, uh, it's it, Auditioning is a beast unto itself. A lot of people think right. it's really simple and they don't really understand the process. It's harrowing every time. The only thing that mm. happens, it's kind of like, um, in, this is a horrible analogy. I'm going to go for it. It's kind of <laughs> like, uh, uh, um, uh, a, not an illness, but like a, um, like a, a, a wound or like a, a, like a bad hip or, you know, a bad knee. It, it hurts. Mm-hmm. It, it still hurts to yeah. walk on, but your body like adapts to it. It it never it never stops hurting though. This is a horrible analogy. Um, <laughs> I understand I like, what you're talking about though. I, I totally understand. I feel understand like y'all get about. it. You know what I mean? Like it. it I, I it get it. I totally get it. <laughs> it doesn't easier. The, the the pains like the pain of like the the experience doesn't get less. You just kind of get used to it. 
It's you like just like, yeah, it's like it. um, another day. All right, got it. Cool. Oh, <laughs> love that line. Oh, we're in that relationship. They're not gonna bring me back. Cool. Bet we'll move on. Oh, that was bomb. I did a good job. Still didn't get it though. You know what I mean? You just kind of gotta mm-hmm. roll with it. Mm-hmm. And then when it's your turn, it's your turn. And it's when it, when it's your time, it's your time. And nobody can really mess with that. You know. So. So when it came to um, when it came to being in the in the hateful eight. Did you have to audition again or were, were you already like one of Tarantino's players? You know what I mean? Where he's just like, Hey, I got something else for you. He called and left me a voicemail. Left me a voicemail. <laughs> oh, Jesus. That's still, amazing. I still have it. Let me see. Do I still have it? I would, I would, I would have that. Hell yeah. <laughs> I'd save it as a voice note. Are you uh, kidding me? I, I, I think I still have it. Let me see. I'm pretty certain. Oh yeah. Well, while well, you look for that, while well, you look for that, I'll well, say. I got it. Um, Wait, listen. Oh, Let me oh, see. perfect. Amazon is on oh, deck. So I missed him at some point, and we were trying to link up right. and have a dinner or something, but he called and left. He's like, listen, call me. I I, I want to share something with you. I have this idea. And I was like hyperventilating. I was like, what? Oh my God. Okay. okay, calm down. And I was also like, I was really just happy to hear from my boy. Like I, I love Q like this. He's, he's great. I haven't talked to him in a long time, but you know how it yeah. goes. Um, yeah. He's, I, you know, <laughs> It was uh, it was uh, a wonderful experience on Django. It was really tough though at times. It, the content alone right. is like really complicated material. Also, people have their yeah. own opinions about Quentin and such subject mm-hmm. matter. Um, and being a woman of color, being a black woman, it gets complicated at times um, when you are, you know, socially intelligent and also consider yourself an activist but then like people are expressing their artistry and it's just it gets complicated um yeah i will but i will never not speak up or say how i feel about something if i think some bullshit is happening um anyway he left a voicemail and then i called him back immediately and he was like i have this part for you i wrote no he said i wrote this script and i wrote this character specifically for you and I'm hoping you're available. I hope you can do it. And I'm like, I told him, I was like, Quinn, if I was getting married, <laughs> move the wedding date. What do you mean? Like, what? Right. Of course, I'm like, yeah. yeah. Let, and let I just got this. to work. Time I started time out. Time rolling stick. Out. Wait, what? What? Time no, out. Nigel, time what? Time <laughs> you broke him. You broke yeah, Nigel. I was trying not to say anything. I was trying to keep it cold. What happened? <laughs> first of all, you just gorilla flex on the world just now and be like, hey, oh, no, my boy Q, <laughs> I have a message from him, so I have to play it for you guys. Can I play it for you guys? Amazing. I'm play it for can you guys. I just tell you, can I just tell you, I actually Amazing. have not listened to that voicemail in years. And so it's actually fun because because Omar asked me the question, like, so how did that work? Hey, you know, I and as a matter of fact, I got a voicemail. He is the voicemail. I love it. I want, let me explain to you why I'm so excited and I love this so much. Okay. When I met Dana, mm-hmm. I didn't know none of what she did. I mm-hmm. met her through family, right? My boy, who she grew up with in New Orleans, introduced Ronald. me and we were like, Ronald Career. Shouts out to Ronald Career. Ro, we love you. <laughs> He introduced me, but then we find out that her yeah. cousin and I went to preschool together in Los Angeles. But well, wait, <laughs> Nigel, no. No, babe, I met you in LA first through you Janae. Did. You did. We With were drunk. CJ wait. and wait. who else? Was it Jovan? CJ and Probably. And yeah. do you remember that crazy night we had? Like it was so much fun. I have pictures still from that night. I may not remember it. That's <laughs> why I'm saying. Me neither. Good thing there are pictures. You blanked it all out. Like, he doesn't even remember I, it. <laughs> it was so much fun. I was like one of the best nights. I had come to visit. That was when I came to check out CalArts before I went there to school. So it was back no in 07. I yeah, it was like oh, it was like that 07. might have been right before I moved to New Orleans. Then it was. It so certainly you moved was. to LA, and I moved to to New Orleans. Exactly. 
And so when you were in NOLA, we, everyone was kind of surprised that we already knew each other. So, but he did, uh, Ronald is still our connection though. Ronald is uh, plenty of people's connection in the city of New Orleans <laughs> and everybody loves him and respects him. In, New you know, Orleans, regard. Billy D. Williams. Literally. Like, <laughs> he's New Orleans very own Barack Obama. Like, so, you know. <laughs> um, but so there is that connection there. But Nigel and I actually technically met years prior uh, in L.A. having a crazy ass night with my cousin Janae. Shout out to Janae, who is a prolific, fantastic producer, winning awards. I'm so proud of her. Um, her best role is mother. I'm so, so proud of her and, you know, all of the kids. So um, I met Nigel through Janae, my cousin. And then, you know, that would begin our friendship and I've always kept up with him and checked on him and watched him do his thing and asked for some shrimp and grits and the whole nine yards. You, know? <laughs> you can all give me accolades all you proud want. Of. I'm proud because Be I have a friend that is getting voicemails from Q, but that was years ago. <laughs> that was years years ago. ago. But time out, time out. I got a story I'm about to drop on all y'all, right? Oh, so no. I'm in New Orleans with the homies. We're just watching TV and randomly some movie is on and we're not really paying attention to it at all. <laughs> um, Nigel. And then all of a sudden I look up and I see somebody <sighs> stepping on these all right. mutant all right. frogs. <laughs> mutant. Oh my, did you come on to be adding mutant Alien frogs. mutant frogs. <laughs> and then there was a scene. At where she grabbed them and said, toes. and ripped them apart. <laughs> and I looked so and gross. I said, so I know gross. her. <laughs> and I recorded no, the damn scene. Because I said, she really no, to me. then made it. She I made it. what she does she in the future. Frogs. That's, oh you my know. God. So, so let's give context. The name of the film Let's. is, can we call it a film? It's called Haunted High. It was a sci-fi network movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It is, it is and so amazing. At one point, the whole high school is haunted. She's a coach. She gets trapped inside with several students and some other people and the bad spirits. <laughs> and at one point in the chemistry lab, the biology lab, the frogs come alive. <laughs> Nigel, I hate <laughs> <laughs> the frogs come alive and she just like gets this empowerment and she's like like f these frogs and she starts stomping them and then i had to take one and rip it apart i squeezed them it was so <laughs> disgusting and so stupid no disrespect That's to the folks it was just one of my earlier on credits and let me tell you at the time i was in it i was gonna kill them frogs i was gonna stomp oh, them oh yeah you did that i was you did in it. my character yeah. You killed them motherfucking those, frogs. They were dead. Those you know what? Movies, shout, out to, shout out to Danny Trejo. He was in that movie and he was of he was the of course he was. Machete? He was the yeah, he was literally he's the sweetest guy in the world. He is literally yeah. the kind of I'm talking desperado, woman on your chest tattoo, yeah. night <laughs> yeah. throwing Danny Trejo is a teddy bear. He's a sweetheart. <laughs> yeah. Man, his his story is amazing. His story mm -hmm. is actually like, oh, he's like, yeah, I spent a lot of time in jail <laughs> and in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The most humble, sweetest, like very kind guy. So it's amazing. Well, That's amazing. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> hey, blow up is real. I mean, you went from alien mutated frogs to Django. The D is silent. <laughs> and <laughs> hateful um, eight. Um, and American Back horror. This story. day is like one of the, the most fun films I've worked on because he there is so much it was even more fun than Hateful Eight and Hateful was amazing too but Django was really special like mm -hmm. for every 1000 rolls of film you know we have a shot a company shot like so everyone they pass around an alcoholic beverage and we all drink together we cheers to 1000 <laughs> right <laughs> um, and uh you know just so many different things there would be quotes of the of the night I I worked I wanted so badly to get quote of the day. And it was my last week of work. I worked on Django for like almost three months. 
and it was my last uh my last week of work and it was the scene we shot where I run at the end and the next day my thighs were really killing me because we did it like seven times and I almost fainted at the end it was a lot but it, it was it and I, and I had to do it well because it was my idea I was like Quinn I got this idea and he's like oh I love it let's shoot it and I'm like what no I was just <laughs> <You're> like, uh. <laughs> right but we but we did it and then um the next day my thighs were killing me and I was like oh my thighs hurt and then Quinn starts dying laughing he goes Bill, put that on on the list to 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 vote on for quote of the day, and I was like, "What?" And the next <laughs> day, uh, that that day or the next day, it goes on the call sheet with the quote from the the day before, and I made it. And that's I was hilarious. like, yeah, my, "Oh, my thighs made it!" Man, so. that scene was hilarious. <laughs> you you, put, you hiked up your dress. Oh, get myself out of here! Yeah, <laughs> I was ready to go. I was ready to go. I yeah. love it. I well, love I'm it. super like grateful. It. There are lots of different. Um, projects that I've been a part of that I, I'm so grateful to have been a part of, you know. Well, it's 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 interesting because I just watched a a documentary. I think it was it was like called Q QT Eight. You know, the first it was about Quentin's first eight films. Hmm. So it's, a, it's like hmm. a whole documentary on the first eight movies that he made, which yeah. is which ends at Hateful Eight. Um, yeah, because okay. I think ninth is the ninth. The ninth movie is Hollywood, the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So mm-hmm. he just put so out a, I, a novel. Oh, really? Yeah, he put out a novel, um, or he's about to put out a novel called, it's named the same thing, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And it's just more of a condensed, not condensed, a more dense version of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's the whole story of the film that, oh, you, nice. that people have seen. Yeah. Well, I actually I have a graphic novel that he uh, co-wrote. It's uh, Django meets Zorro. I did hear about that. It's like a, that. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You never heard about yeah, that? Yeah. I have the I have, I have. I'm not gonna flex. Let me chill. I have. <laughs> I, just did, I have the voicemail where he told me uh, I'm gonna write this. <laughs> I have the comics, the Django uh, and Zorro comics. They're not, I didn't get his auto, uh, his autograph or I didn't get him to sign them, but I have them. They were a rap gift. I don't remember. Oh, dope. Or did I get them? Yeah, I have it as uh, a hard later. copy. I don't know, but I have them. I have several of them. Q, anyway, get that yeah. signature, baby. It's really good. But, so, but, 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 the, but oh, what okay. I was getting to, sorry, well, what I was getting to was that because of that, I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to rewatch the last couple. So I started mm-hmm. watching from Kill Bill on. Mm-hmm. So I... Literally, have have just recently watched your work like back to back. Particularly, particularly the Hateful Eight, you know, because that's obviously the last one uh, that I yeah. had seen. And it's just like, and then Nigel says, "Oh, I happened, you know, we're gonna interview Dana," and I was like, "What?" I was like, "Dude, I was just watching her." You know what I mean? That's crazy. that's crazy. And, and, and I, I loved it. I mean, it was great. Like, oh, thank you're you. amazing. Thank you so much. It's so it's such a it's such small moments. I don't like to say it's small parts or anything like that, but it's like you you don't have a whole ton of screen time. So what you have, you have to make it pop. Yeah. And so I mean, it's, it's I I started. So there's this one scene, as you know, with Channing Tatum, and he asked me to roll him a cigarette. I right. started. I don't know anything about rolling cigarettes, and I still have the video footage of Tim <laughs> Roth. But it was Tim. Tim Roth taught me how to roll a cigarette. And so um, I got from the props masters and department, I got Norwegian shag and rolling papers mailed to me. <laughs> I must have rolled like 1,500 cigarettes just for that three seconds that you see. <laughs> I wanted it to be so on point because my thought was it's freezing on the mountain. My fingers are going to be cold. Quentin wants it a specific way. I cannot be the weak link. I got to roll this shit in less than a half a page of time. I had Susan, you know, right. Susan, Susan would time me rolling time. cigarettes. And I would, <laughs> so we, we would read the half a page of text of time that I had to roll the cigarette. And mm. I would, she would stopwatch timing. I could have helped And it's you with like, that. nobody knows that shit. Nobody's ever going to know the, the amount of work that was put into something that was less right. than 10 yeah. It's, it's literally like, here you go. It's like, that's it. Yeah, it's a, it's a craft. 
But guess you know what I mean? You have to you have to learn it. Like it's it, it's go crazy. ahead, Nigel. He's not just trying to double dutch. Go ahead. Dan. He's like, uh. if you didn't do that, people like me and Omar would be like, she don't know what she's doing. <laughs> she ain't never no. a joint before in her life. Dude, no. Well, okay. I, I will say this. I used to smoke cigarettes. I used to I used to be a cigarette smoker, and at one point I was rolling my own cigarettes. Mm-hmm. And that is not easy. And even if you no. rolled joints before, bro, it's the consistency the of it's tobacco totally is so much different. And your first couple totally ones end different. up looking like that snake that ate Millhouse. Like they're all fat in the middle it's and they're horrible. all thin on the side. <laughs> I used yeah. to smoke Valley Shad. I had plenty of those that I had to throw away. They're horrible. <laughs> and then on the day, uh, Channing, we I rolled a Norwegian shag one and he got kind of like, sick with it it was just too much it was like Tobacco, a really yeah. <laughs> Got that and he was like how are you smoking this and I, I was like oh I prep my lungs I smoke like half a one a day leading up to shooting because I knew that there would be altitude issues I wanted to yep. prepare my lungs I know I was like super method dedicated to it and he at by the end of it he was like not end of it but like when we got into the scene he was like I need you to roll me the organic fake cigarette star the mm-hmm. herbal and which is as you know omar it's a different consistency so i was like all right <laughs> lean on your training lean on your work lean on a 1500 cigarettes you can do this you know so anyway the people uh, um you, pl- you you're an actor you're going to play several different roles like how do you get into that creative how do you get in your creative process how do you um you know take on these roles and like get in that zone I begin with table work. So I'll get my script and I start breaking it down immediately. I get like highlighter pens and pencils and the whole nine yards and sticky tabs. And I look for clues because, you know, uh, I think um, a decent actor will tell you it's not the words that you're saying. It's not your part. You really find out about your characters, what everyone else in the script is saying about your character. Um, It indicates a lot. Uh, and so sometimes it's applicable, sometimes it's not, but, um, for the most part, I break the script down first and then I get her in my body, whoever she is. Um, and then I make myself as malleable as possible because I've worked with enough directors that will change on a dime. Like the, you'll come into work with an idea and a concept and a way that you think she is and moves and, uh, and, and functions. And then you will quickly realize it's not what uh, the director wants. And so you have to, on your heels, turn very quickly and figure something out. So I try to make sure the, the words, the intentions, the meaning, the why behind it all is so embedded in my body that I can do it any other way that they want. Um, P Valley, which was uh, on Stars and aired last summer, I think, or no, this, I don't know, maybe this, uh, uh, this over the winter, maybe. I don't, I don't remember. I think it's been in the fall, maybe. Uh, it's on a new star. P Valley is on a, on a. Wait, what'd you say? COVID threw everything in the wax. So like last year, this year. Right. I shot it last year, like last summer. Um, Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. I shot it the summer before. So maybe it came out last summer. Just COVID 2020 is just like a blur for everyone. You get that year back, by the way. hmm? You get that year back, by the way. Yeah, we do. So like if you turned whatever last year, you get to turn that again this year. Because last year we (laughs) threw it up. Get the hell out of here. That's right. That's right, babe. I feel it. Um, But P Valley was, it's a show based on a strip club, like the little strip club that could. And yeah. And at first I was like, what am I doing? Am I dancing? What's happening? But I'm a patron. (laughs) And so I've never really been to a strip club or had a lap dance or any of those things. And it's like, well, how do you prepare for that? Um, you could go out and figure it out, but for me, it was just being right, go to strip club. But for me, it was just kind of being open and susceptible and free enough to explore what Katori and the team wanted me to explore, which was not easy because 
uh, it was the most risque thing I had done uh, up to that point. Um, and I mean, I'm throwing money everywhere. I'm like, yeah, bitches. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like going off. I'm like, oh my God, this is the furthest character from me. Like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, like, oh my God, this is so nerve wracking. My parents cannot see this. Oh my God. <laughs> They're like full on nude by the end of the, the montage. And it was mm-hmm. just like the first time I had to sign a sex waiver and a nudity clause. And it was, uh, really nerve-wracking i was like oh my god what's happening i was really nervous but i do have to say i have this mechanism when working it doesn't matter what's going on in my personal life or because i didn't been through some shit and then had to work um <laughs> but when when yeah. they're like action like something in me just like clicks and i just go right uh, it's i have time. to uh, yeah it's just go time and then um that happened recently with U.S. versus Billie Holiday, which is now out on Hulu. Who, mm-hmm. Andrew Day, our star of, of the film, just won the Golden Globe, and she's nominated for the Academy Award for her work, and she deserves it. She's amazing, and she's the sweetest person in the world, by the way. Um, and I only worked on the film for one day, but like I know Lee, I worked with Lee on the Butler, Lee Daniels on mm-hmm. the Butler. Mm-hmm. And so it would be in that, what, seven, eight years later, we were reunited. Mm-hmm. And I know him. He's particular. He wants it a certain way. And he does not do phoned in. He don't do no bullshit. And right. I had to work that day. And like, you know, at one point he was like, you're acting. I need you to don't do that. Just uh, that's it. a tough, that's a tough note. <laughs> oh God, the worst note you can give an actor. It is the worst. It's, it's like note. so hard to receive. It's like, what? I don't know okay. what I'm doing. What do I do? Yeah, it like it throws, throws it throws everything you're doing off. Like I've gotten yeah. notes like that he when I was doing theater. Doing. Uh, he knew what he was doing though. He knew to say that to me because yeah. he knew he would get a different performance out of me. And it's yeah. one little scene, it's like 30 seconds, but it it's it is like a hard jab. It's like a good punch. So you know, I did my job, you know what I mean. Um, but that's out on Hulu. You were talking about other roles. And so I was just kind of segueing into that as well in regards to the creative process. I start with the scripts and then I, I move and then I get it into my body, the character. Um, and I figure out what everybody wants, or at least I try to figure that out. And what's the impetus behind? What is the motivation behind all of this? You know what I mean? How do you get it out? You said you have to uh, take that character in. Have you ever found a place where you're like, this crazy motherfucker need to get out of here. I need to. Yeah, I have like, yeah. So in, I guess it was 2011. I did sort of a, a small tour with this, you know, sort of makeshift company for a show called Maria Cazito. And it was a part of a project called Solography, which was a project that was taking a long, hard look at, uh, genocides in different countries and mm-hmm. I played Maria Cazito who the play was named for which is a, a real woman she was a Rwandan nun and she aided in the death of some 5,000 people and the problem that that's all the problem but also I'm a practicing Catholic I'm not a great Catholic I don't go to church every Sunday but I'm a practicing Catholic more or less and so is she. So embedded in the script were Hail Marys and Our Fathers. And like she used her religion as a means to justify her very heinous, very dark, very villainous behavior. And that was to date the darkest character I've ever had to play. And I couldn't really get into her. Like I didn't understand how to defend her as a character or play her. Um, and I did a bunch of research on the actual woman and someone was quoted, I read some article and someone was quoted in the article saying about her and an RPF soldier uh, leader. They were like, uh, they were always they were, together, they were inseparable and they were almost like husband and wife. And when I read that, it was like, oh, she did this for love. She was so enamored with this man. And think about it, she became a nun at 19. So like, she was so enamored with this right. man. She was like willing to do whatever he 
she believed in whatever yeah. car ever drive mm -hmm. so that was my way of like trying to play her in a way that would make sense because none of what she did made sense to me mm -hmm. and then afterwards i did my rituals which is like a full body massage and then i go home and then i probably do a meditation i go to church to like breathe the character out i know that sounds like a, a lot of bullshit but like if you're not careful i mean you've seen so many actors get caught up in the roles that they portray especially when they're dark and you see them mm -hmm. get caught up you see them get lost and you see they don't come back so um Anyway, I do my due diligence to take care of myself and to do what I can on a set um, and off a set to make sure, you know, mental health is paramount. Love it. Love it. you giving us gems, baby. you just dropping Oh, gems. Lord. There he go. Okay. You I got to go <laughs> You get a gem. You get a gem. You Throwing get it a out gym. there like Trump. <laughs> uh. I can't. <laughs> You're no... No, <laughs> I love it. I love it. So yeah. <clears throat> we, we, we've gotten your origin story. We've talked about your creative process. Uh, this wouldn't be the gumbo pot podcast without us diving into a little bit of food. Um, okay. You, you are. Yes. Let's New end Orleans. on that positive note of, of the delicious. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? There wasn't the last meal I ate. There's a couple. There's a couple. We're going we're gonna to throw okay. a couple of questions out. So first and foremost, before we even get into the, you know, what's your last meal, um, what is your relationship with food? Uh, it's complicated. Mm. So being where I'm from, it's just like everything tastes good. And so at <laughs> very early age, you learn to love, appreciate, respect, value food. Everything we do is centered around food. And like, that ain't always like the best for your body. So it's like <laughs> a really complicated dance to like enjoy the pleasures of life, but then like also like create the space of discipline mm -hmm. within your body for your health as well, which has always been a challenge for me because it's comfortable to just eat and like yeah. have a, you know, go to Cane's in the middle of the night you know <laughs> like, why do i have to run away from the comfort if i right? need a hug in my stomach and then also like the deliciousness and artistry of cooking and like it's spiritual yep. so it's like my relationship is a complicated one just like any anyone that you would love you know what i mean i, I think love it. yeah that makes sense i love so. it i love it well you you already well, threw the question out there what was your last meal? Before I got to ask you, what would be your last meal? Oh, what would be my last meal? Yeah, if it, oh. it was your last meal on earth, and <laughs> it, it, it could be anything. Like, it doesn't just have to be a specific one thing. It could also be, you know, we've had people say things like, like Duck from Ducky Chase. He was like, he named off a bunch of different dishes, but he was also like, I better have my family there. I'm going to cuss everybody out kind of thing. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, for knee-jerk reaction out the gate was my mama's gumbo. Not anybody's yeah. gumbo, but like gumbo. my mom. My, yeah. Specifically my mama's gumbo, which is really Claudia's gumbo, my grandmother's gumbo, which is really Toonie, Yolanda, her gumbo, my great-grandmother's gumbo. And my mother is <laughs> After my great grandmother, so it's like Yolanda Claudia and Yolanda's gumbo. That's what I would have. I um, and, uh, uh, probably a fillet, mid rare. I love beef. Um, yeah. Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Not kidding. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and probably something really dirty and like dairy-ish like a delicious crab baked macaroni and cheese i don't know like good shit mm. bread yeah. butter yeah <laughs> you know, fucking captain crunch who knows you know what i mean like yeah. <laughs> give me everything all of the good things that you love you know it's I the last thing i'm gonna eat so give like, it to me know? all of it give it to me all of it all the things i, I love, love you know i love it oh man this has been so fun guys 
Thank you so much. We appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you for being on. Well, yeah. Before you go, um, yes. we always, always, always get, um, we used to call them pearls of wisdom. That's what my grandmother's used, you know, little tidbits of knowledge <laughs> that, uh, get dropped across the board. But, um, you know, give us, you know, that, that drop some knowledge, drop some Dana knowledge, drop like that knowledge for the next Dana or the aspiring <laughs> Dana coming behind you, like. Give it to us and give it to us raw. Uh. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm a big advocate of mental health. Right. And, you know, it's never the what you do. It's always the why behind it. And so I guess my pearl of wisdom, if you want to call it that, would be to... Um, deal with yourself deal with your shit and be a whole human for others like don't be no half-ass person for your family and your friends don't be selfish be a whole you um because i think anything and everything you do beyond being your whole self uh will dictate success and will lead you to ultimately happiness because when you half-ass it, you know you half-assed it. And you know you want some weird, selfish shit. And that's never cool. <laughs> so, I say be a whole human. Be your whole, most authentic, best version of yourself. And guess what? You're going to be doing that till they throw dirt in your face. till people are praying at your funeral. But I think the point is keep working towards it. That's all I got. Beep, beep, beep. Give me one. Hey, I do. You knew it was coming. Remember the whole ass everything. The whole ass everything. The whole ass everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, from your lips. I love you guys. To God's ears. We love you too. Thank, Thank you, you for, everything. for joining us. I will um, come back to the Gumbo Podcast anytime. Now, tell us if uh, is there a website is how do we follow you is there instagram oh, is public oh, yeah, like, yeah my it. name all the social media platforms it's all the same which is dana d-a-n-a gurrier g-o-u-r-r-i-e-r -E that's my handle at dana gurrier for everything you know perfect keeping it simple all right party people dana thank you very much for joining us um my pleasure thank you guys time. for having me i know me. you you on a schedule we love you I love you, you guys. And I hope to see y'all again soon. You will with drinks. Yes. With real <laughs> drinks. Oh yeah. We love the framboise and all the good stuff. The framboise. Right. <laughs> Pinky swear. <laughs> the Pinky swear. Bye guys. Love y'all. Love you. Thank you very much. Take care.